But um, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come tonight, Lord, just looking forward to meeting with each other once again and fellowshipping with one another. But Father, we so want to meet with you tonight and uh, want to be touched by your spirit and uh, by your presence. And so, Father, we welcome you here among us right now. Lord, as that beautiful picture you've painted in the book of Revelation, as Jesus walking among the candlesticks in um, that great uh, fellowship of your spirit with your church. And Father, we, we do come tonight welcoming you here, Lord, asking that you would help to comfort our hearts in the times that we live in. Father, that you would encourage us to remain strong, that you would encourage us, Father, to remain steadfast in your word and in your truth and following after you. And uh, even if it comes to the point of separating ourselves completely from the world around us, Lord, we know that uh, you've called us to be separate, but that is a, a fearful thing oftentimes. So, Father, give us courage. Give us uh, encouragement. And uh, we love you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, there you go. Uh, you heard the prayer tonight. And uh, <laughs> that gives you a little bit of insight into where we're going tonight with the study. Um, you know, we uh, have been going through this for quite some time. This is our fifth installment of the Prophecy 2022 series. Uh, but all last year we were doing it as well. And so we've covered a lot of topics and some of the things that we cover, you know, they, they intermesh with other topics. And uh, this is one of those, you know, certainly we've talked about um, kind of just overall sexual immorality in general uh, in the world today. And uh, we've looked at that in comparison or, or in contrast with the way the church has embraced a lot of those things that uh, the world has embraced. And, um, and, you know, when we talk about prophecy, you know, sometimes we get excited about the rapture and, and the second coming, and certainly that's a, 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 a thing that should happen in the heart of the believer, is that we have an expectation that Jesus is going to return someday, hopefully very soon, and, and rapture us out of here. Um, we also, you know, just think about that time where we will spend with him in that thousand year reign where Jesus is upon the earth and he's reigning from Jerusalem and we're reigning with him and ruling with him. And all those things are, are something to look forward to as well. Uh, we think about the time where we will spend all of eternity in the presence of God after that thousand year reign. And all those things bring great comfort to our hearts. They bring great encouragement to our hearts. Um, but that's not the end of the story, is it? Uh, the second coming, or, or actually the, uh, the idea of biblical prophecy, also holds the idea of God's wrath falling upon the earth. And we looked at that last time we met. We went into great detail about the wrath of God coming upon uh, the earth. And, uh, you know, that's an aspect of it that we don't want to look at too often. But uh, it's, it's a part of the end time scenario. And if we want to talk about, you know, how do you know uh, we're living in the end times? You know, those questions are asked. How do you know? What's your, your top five things that tell us we're living in the end times? Or top 10 or top 25, however many you want to say. And, um, and, and I think that the Bible certainly gives us indicators throughout, and I've looked at those top five, you know, globalism and what's going on in Israel, what's going on in the church, you know, the apostasy of the church, what's happening as far as, um, you know, what Daniel talked about, you know, uh, well, the actually, actually the angel told Daniel, you know, all that stuff I just told you, seal it up in a book, uh, it's not going to make any sense to you. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things happening, a lot of people going to and fro upon the earth, and a, a lot of things happening, and so just seal it up for now. And, uh, and we look at that as, as the idea that Bible prophecy is going to be fulfilled all the way along, and a lot of things are going to happen that allow us to understand, oh, 
That's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We can see that now where we couldn't see that hundreds of years ago or, or thousands of years ago. But now because so many things have happened, it makes sense to us now. And we see it and we understand it as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Well, uh, you know, there are those aspects. But certainly, again, this idea of God's wrath and uh, what God expects from man and the, the times that he has poured out his wrath in the past often gives us an indicator of when we are approaching another time in which God is going to pour out his wrath. And of course, the upcoming time that we're looking at is the tribulation period. Uh, certainly that is a point where, where Satan will have total dominion over the, the peoples of the earth and uh, the Holy Spirit, or at least the restraining power of the Holy Spirit, will be removed. And Satan and his minions will be allowed to do whatever they want to do for this period of time we know as the tribulation period. But then God's wrath in the second part of that seven-year tribulation period will be poured out. And, uh, and so why is God's wrath going to be poured out? We ask that question. And, and the Bible is very clear. Uh, there's a there's a, a number of things that give us indications of why God allows things to happen, why He doesn't just you know stomp us every time we do something wrong. He allows a man to have free will. He allows man to uh, do the things he wants to do. He warns him. He gives him a space to repent. And then there comes a time where God's wrath is is poured out because it has to be poured out because there's just nothing left good. In, in the earth any longer. And um, one of the things I think that we can look at is in here in uh, Romans 1, 18 through 32, a very, very powerful passage of scripture. It's not a passage of scripture that we normally look at as a biblical prophecy passage though. It's, um, it's more of a, you know, the condition of your heart and, and those kind of things. We look at Romans chapter 1 and, uh, and, and try to understand it in those contexts and, and maybe, uh, you know, just the wicked of, wickedness of man in general and that God will in general, you know, pour out his wrath, those kind of things. But I think we can also look at it in light of Bible prophecy. And uh, that's what I want to look at here tonight. And as we begin that idea, I've entitled the message tonight, Given Over, because that is a statement that appears in this passage on a couple of occasions. Uh, man did this, and then God gave them over. <laughs> man did this, gave up uh, worshiping God and started worshiping creatures, and God gave them over. God, uh, you know, man did these things and God gave them over. And uh, again, as that occurs over and over and over again in a society and upon the earth, uh, I think we can see it as a form of biblical prophecy where God has given over the world now, it appears, uh, to many degrees, um, to this debased mind and uh, corrupted mind. As man has turned his back on God and has turned uh, a focus toward man himself and has started worshiping man and worshiping the earth and worshiping the creatures on the earth, I think we can see Bible prophecy being fulfilled in that sense that God is saying, okay, if that's what you want to do, go ahead, but there will be a price to pay and it will be a very heavy price to pay indeed. And so I wanna look at that in terms of Bible prophecy and what we see happening in our world today as we kind of make our way through this very crazy time that we're living in, isn't it? Uh, uh, just a, an insane time that we're living in. And so um, I guess kind of a, um, you know, uh, um, an overall, um, you know, good example of this passage is, is found here in Romans 1, 23 through 25. They, man, changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals. It goes on a little bit there. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to disobey their uh, or to dishonor their bodies among themselves who ch exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. 
And again, I, I think that is a, a great example of this passage that we're going to look at here tonight. Man says, I don't want to worship God. I don't care about God. I'm putting God aside. He's got too many rules and regulations. I want to do what I want to do. I want to go worship myself. I want to go worship the earth. I want to go worship animals. I want to go do what I want to do. I don't care what God says. And uh, therefore, God gave them up to that. If that's what you want to do, if that's the uncleanness that you want to be involved in, I'm going to give you up to that. In the lust of their hearts, it says, to dishonor themselves because why? They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And I think that is so, so powerful. Uh, it's one of the reasons this, this whole passage, this whole chapter is just this monumental, uh, profound passage of Scripture. And if you've never really taken the time to read chapter 1 of Romans uh, to any in-depth degree, I really encourage you to do that. I mean, it is. Paul comes out swinging. <laughs> First chapter of Romans, he just punches everybody in the nose, you know. And it's like, <laughs> whoa, by the end of chapter one, you're just like, whoa, holy cow. But, um, you know, it's so inspired by God. It's so right, right on in what he's saying here. And, you know, again, we can look at that in our own personal lives and say, well, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm kind of you know, doing this, where I should be doing this. Um, but on a whole scale, wholesale, uh, a scale level of the whole earth, where the whole earth is beginning to do this very thing. And societies are giving themselves over completely to wickedness and, and forgetting about God and exchanging the truth of God for a lie. That's when I think we can really start seeing wow, we are living in some really crazy times right now. I mean, certainly these things have happened in the past, and it is an indictment on the whole human race back to day one. Uh, but when we start to see it on this, this large scale, we begin to compare it with pre-flood. We begin to compare it with, that's it. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm sorry I made the whole thing. And we're done with it, and we're going to start over from scratch, you know. And uh, again, I believe that we are headed in that direction. And that's why I chose this graphic over here on the left that you see, um, you know, where man is just worshiping himself. His imaginations of his heart, hey, I can do anything I want to do. I can say I'm a woman when I'm really a man. You know, I can, I can imagine anything, and it's going to be true. And, uh, and that's what I want to do, and who cares about God? And it really just is this uh, complete um, give myself over to every lust I have in my heart. And God says, okay, there you go. If that's what you want to do, there you go. And so that's what we're going to be looking at here tonight in light of Bible prophecy. Again, uh, June is LGBT Pride Month. I, I know you guys are all celebrating that and all happy about that. Um, <laughs> where we commemorate the tremendous strides that LGBTQIAXYZ, and, and you get it, uh, people have made in history. Equality means more than passing laws, someone has said. The struggle is really won in the hearts and minds of the communities where it really counts. And, you know, it's true. It's true what they're saying there. That is, they're, they're not pulling any punches, are they? They want to change the hearts and minds of men and women and boys and girls. And we see that happening. Our school systems are completely given over to it now. Our uh, higher education systems are completely given over to it now. Corporations are now completely given over to it. Uh, I know that, um, you know, if you're not pro uh LGBT Pride Month in your corporation, you're going to suffer for it. And um, both of the, the corporations that I have contracts with, they've already come out and made their statements, and yeah, we're all about it and, and all that stuff. But uh, again, it tells you where we are as a society. It tells you how far we've come. For them, of course, it's a good thing. For us as believers, as Christians, we begin to wonder, when is God's wrath going to fall? 
how much longer will he allow this to go on? You know, uh, those are the kind of ideas that we think about as Christians, uh, or we should be thinking about. The other side of that is, how much longer can I stay engaged in this world? How much longer until I completely separate myself from this world before it drags me down and my family with it? You know, those are the questions that we are having to ask ourselves now in the time that we are living in because of this wholesale giving over to um, the, the lusts of our hearts and the lusts of the flesh around us and in the world that we live in today. And it really is looking more and more like Sodom and Gomorrah. Every year that passes, it's more and more accepted. And those who don't accept it are more and more persecuted for not accepting it. And, uh, you know, I, it even make, gives me pause to even talk about this stuff, you know, because uh, how long will it take before I'm silenced for even discussing this matter? You know, uh, I, as I'm preparing this study here today, this afternoon, I'm thinking, what if my boss gets online and <laughs> types my name in? Oh, he's a pastor? Oh, let's check him out here. <laughs> the first sermon that pops up is this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> anti-LGBT thing, you know, that their company is all about. I'm going to get fired in a heartbeat, you know. Uh, they'll, make, they'll make a reason for why they fired me, but that's going to be it. But uh, that's the world we live in right now. It is the world we live in right now. And so it's interesting. It's pride. We should be prideful about these things is the idea. Look at uh, Genesis 9-11 here where God, after he pours out his wrath on the entire earth and wipes out everybody on the entire earth for their uh, disobedience and rebellion against him and against his will. And uh, he sends this flood and then he says, I will, make, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And so the very symbol that God chose to use as a, hey, you know, I know I've destroyed the whole earth, I've poured out my wrath, but now I want to start over, and with the inhabitants of the earth, I want to make a deal with you, I want to make a covenant with you, here's my covenant, I won't destroy the earth again by a flood. I won't destroy the earth again by flood. And, and here we are in 2022, some 4,000 years later, plus probably, and we use the symbol of the rainbow as a symbol of pride to say, we don't have to listen to God. We don't have to do what he tells us to do. We can ignore him and we can do anything that we want to do in the face of a rebellion against the God who created us. I, and it's fascinating. I mean, it's absolutely a mind blower. I mean, did they sit down and think this out? <laughs> Satan did. <laughs> I mean, isn't it just a mind blower that they would use that symbol and the idea of pride to, to promote their, their thing? It, it's just quite an amazing thing if you think about it in those terms. But again, um, pride is that uh, thing that took Satan down. We see there in Isaiah 14, 11, your pride has brought you down to Sheol. And the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you and worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. And I will 
uh, exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That was Satan's motto. I will be God. And of course we know that in the tribulation period, after the church is raptured out, Satan will sit on the throne in Jerusalem in the temple and demand to be worshipped as God. But it's his pride. It's his pride that will ultimately destroy him once again. And so isn't it fascinating that the, the very uh, momentum that carries this movement that we're seeing taking over the world at the heart of it is pride. At the heart of it is uh, ignoring the symbol that God gave us about the wrath and, and the, um, the taking away of that wrath after he destroyed the earth. earth. And so it's quite fascinating to me uh, the things that we're seeing. And I'm not going to make this all about uh, the LGBT thing tonight. I mean, the passage that we're looking at certainly uh, weighs heavily in that, in that regard. But it's really just, you know, rebellion in general. And at the end of the passage, of course, he goes in and gives us, you know, about 30 different types of sins that go right along with that. Uh, the sin that's in and the lust that's in our hearts. But um, along with the, that idea of wrath and the wrath of the flood of the earth, we see what Peter says in his second epistle, chapter three, verse uh, or chapter three, verse three. He says, uh, "Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their lusts. Where is the promise of his coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they, look at that, willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so there is a promise that God's wrath will indeed fall once again upon the earth. It won't come in the same form that it came the first time in the form of a flood. It won't come uh, in the ways that he has destroyed parts of the earth in the past uh, for reasons of pouring out his wrath. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah being one of those. Although Sodom and Gomorrah is a pretty good example uh, of what exactly what Peter is talking about here where the entire earth is reserved for fire it will be destroyed by a fervent heat the Bible says it will be completely melted down there will be nothing left of it at all but the warning here is very very stark people willfully forget that the earth was once destroyed by God's wrath in the form of a flood they willfully forget that. I don't want to remember that. Because if I remember that, and if I give any credence to that, then I have to believe that the other wrath that the Bible talks about is a possibility for my future because of my disobedience toward him. So if I willfully forget that God has judged the earth in the past, I can gleefully go on and do whatever I want to do and not have to worry about God's wrath falling upon me. When I die, I'm just going to go to sleep, and that's going to be it. I'll just be in this soul sleep for the rest of all of eternity. Or, you know, maybe God just, you know, was kidding about all that stuff, and we'll all go to heaven, and nobody will be judged for their sin. And, uh, you know, those are the ideas that man has, but that's not the idea of the Bible. That's not the ideas that God has communicated to us through his word. He has communicated to us through his word that the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so when we think about this passage here tonight, this chapter one of Romans, 
where he says there in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, what? Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress God's truth. They suppress the fact that God has judged in the past. They suppress the fact that God is going to judge again in the future. They suppress the truth of God that says, if you're going to live a righteous life and a godly life, here are the things you don't do and here are the things you do. Uh, a lot like what we're talking about on Sunday morning as we're going through the book of Colossians. As Paul has told us in the, the letter to the Colossians, put off the old man and put on the new man. You know, reject the, the lusts of the flesh and the works of the flesh and begin to cultivate the fruits of the spirit in your life. But every time somebody waves that rainbow flag, every time, every, every time it comes around to June again, every time that kindergarten teacher stands up in front of those little children and begins to tell them that these things are okay, they are suppressing the truth of God. And you know, for a long time, I have said that... Um, you know, it's not the biker you have to worry about. It's not the evil rock musicians you have to worry about so much as that little kindergarten teacher. That little kindergarten teacher who's up there telling those little kids, there is no God. We evolved from the slime. There's nobody that's going to hold you accountable. Everything your parents are telling you at home is wrong. There is no God. You're an animal. You've evolved. And... Uh, you can do whatever you want to do. That is pure, pure evil. And that is a suppression of the truth of God for the purposes of wanting to live an unrighteous life. And the Bible says the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven against that. The wrath of God will be revealed against that very suppression of his truth. And as you move on through that passage, he says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them and to us, is what it's saying. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so we don't have time to get into that argument as much, you know, talking about God's creation and, and the, the design that we see in God's creation and just the, the super decibels that God has spoken this world into existence by uh, a sheer intelligence that we have no concept of. We see all of the complexity in life and, uh, you know, they say, well, it just happened, you know, it's just some explosion happened a long time ago, and here it all is, you know. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard in your life. But because they can't come up with a better idea, they've proposed it, it all just happened, happened by random chance. Something that can't be supported scientifically at all. It's amazing. But again, it's a suppression of God's truth. God has shown us through his creation that it couldn't have happened by itself. Uh, you talk about the human body, you talk about uh, the water cycle I'm always going on about. You talk about, you know, just the, the extreme, um, uh, what's it called? Fine tuning of the universe that we see. And uh, we're just in this place where it's just, just so happens to be ideally suited for life. Isn't that amazing? They talk about the scientists, you know. It's just the earth is just so ideally suited. Yeah, it is. <laughs> because it was created to be, you know. But uh, again, we don't have time to go into that. But God has, has shown it to us. And, and it needs to be suppressed and lied about for people to be deceived enough to not see it. And unfortunately, that's what happens. But um, let's just move on here. We got to cover. I don't want to get sidetracked too often. I love talking about creation and evolution, though. I, I love uh, that whole debate. So this, uh, this is a passage I've taught many times along those lines. But anyway, um, he goes on there in verse 21. He says, because although they knew God, 
They did not glorify him as God. They have a, an understanding, okay, yeah, maybe we're created. Maybe we'll see him someday. I don't care. I'm just still going to live my own life and do what I want to do. I'm not going to glorify him as God. I'm not going to be thankful to this unknown God somewhere. I'm not going to bend the knee. I'm not going to, uh, you know, acknowledge him because I want to live this unrighteous life. And if I acknowledge God, then I have to also acknowledge he has some authority over me. He's created me. I, I will stand before him someday. I'll give an account to him someday. And so I'm not going to glorify him as God. I'm not going to be thankful to him. And as a result, look what it says. They became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so the more we turn away from God, who is dwelling in unapproachable light, the Bible says, what, if we turn from him, what do we see? We, we start going down that road of darkness. And the further we go down that road, the darker it gets. And the more perverted it gets. Our foolish hearts become darkened. Because we don't want to know God, he says, okay. It breaks his heart. It breaks his heart that we reject him in that way. But he allows us. He's not going to force us to love him. He's not going to force us to obey him. But someday we will stand before him and give an account. But it is uh, quite a passage. Our futile hearts, our thoughts, they become darkened. Professing to be wise, now isn't this amazing? They become fools or they became fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And uh, certainly you can see that. The more man turns away from God, I mean, their high priests, our scientists, those are the ones that are telling everybody else and suppressing that truth and saying there is no God. What do they profess to be? They profess to be wise, don't they? They profess to be much wiser than you, you uneducated goofballs out there living in middle America. You don't know anything. You're stupid. I'm... I've got this doctorate degree, and I'll tell you what to believe, and I'll write the textbooks, and, and you'll just kind of follow along. Nod your head in agreement, even though it sounds really stupid. <laughs> Professing to be wise. Ultimately, what are they? The Bible says, hey, uh, fear of God. That's the beginning of wisdom right there. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool, the idiot, the knucklehead has said in his heart, ah, oh, there's no God. We all just kind of, poof, showed up here one day. What is it? From the goo to the zoo to you, I like to say. <laughs> Evolved right up in, into that tree, and right back down the tree, and who knows what else. But look what happens when we take our eyes off God, when we profess ourselves to become, that we are wise in rejecting God, and uh, we change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And that is so true. You know, the, the whole idea of humanism really started at the beginning, although there are good things about humanism, obviously, and just caring for people and hospitals and, and all the things that they've done over the years. But the whole idea was uh, around the time of the... Um, the Renaissance period and the Enlightenment period. The whole thing was, look, there is no God. Let's stop, you know, living our lives according to this old book here and uh, believing in the revelation of this invisible God that doesn't exist. Let's reject all that. We've just got to take care of each other. We've just got to take care of, of people and, and care for their needs because ultimately man is the, the ultimate uh, the, the ultimate first cause here and, and let's just take care of the needs of man. Let's feed man and, and clothe man and, and uh, build nice things for man, all those kind of things. And so the, the focus really turned about 500 years ago or so from a focus on God and wanting to worship God and do those things, caring for the needs of people uh, out of a love for God and all the things that we read in the New Testament about serving uh, for the sake of serving the Lord and caring for the needs of people because God cared so much for us and we're just giving back and all those kind of things. 
uh, that was totally warped and changed into now just a real focus on man, almost a worship of man, and in some cases, certainly there is this worship of man uh, and birds and four-footed animals. You know, that our focus again, if you look at uh, the idea of uh, a wholesale change and going down uh, a different path, you know, the worship of the earth has become a very major thing. Um, and uh, worshiping of Mother Gaia and, uh, you know, just really a, a focus on the animals upon the earth and, and caring for them more than uh, anything else. And so there is that focus that we see there as well. Um, as we've talked in the past, uh, I, I brought up this Burning Man festival, I guess you call it now. Uh, it's out in the desert of Nevada, Black Rock, Nevada. And it really is kind of this uh, modern day Sodom and Gomorrah festival that they have out there. They set it up for a week, week and a half, something like that. Uh, and people just go out there, there are no police, and you can just do whatever you want to do. And they do. And, uh, I mean, it's just hedonism on steroids. And uh, I, I don't have time to go back into it, but I, I was, from time to time, I'll go back to it just to see what's happening with that. And they, they haven't done anything with it for the last two years because of COVID. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they're gearing up, and there's still time to buy your tickets to go out to Burning Man this year, if you haven't got your tickets yet. The theme this year is Waking Dreams, and uh, I, was, I was just kind of reading a little bit about it. The 2022 uh, Burning Man theme will explore the transformative uh, power of dreams, both literal and figurative and celebrate the dreamers who channel this potential energy into uh, in eye-opening, often surrealistic, sometimes life-changing ways. Uh, and then they use this quote, I dreamed I was a butterfly flitting around the sky, then I awoke, now I wonder, am I a man who dreamt of being a butterfly, or am, am I a butterfly dreaming that I am a man? And that's the quote they use to introduce this theme for the year and they go into a, a lot of detail I didn't I didn't want to bring in the other aspects of what they were talking about but you know it kind of goes along with this thing that uh, we see from time to well we see a lot today is just the imaginations of man you know because of computers because of uh, computer animation because of uh, just the ability to make anything look possible right uh, it's amazing what they can do with computers now. I mean, they produce movies now, and uh, hey, looks like that guy just flew across the sky to me. You know, I mean, it's like anything is possible. You know, that all oh, that look at the alien ship is coming down now, and here come the aliens, and and they just ate all the humans, and all those things they can do with computer animation. Um, it really has kind of warped man's sense of what is real and what is impossible, what's an imagination, what is uh, really, um, you know, real. And it really kind of lends to this idea that man is not satisfied with what God has given us, not content with what we have as a reality, the reality that God has given to us. And, uh, and, and it really kind of marries with this idea of just, I want to do whatever I want to do and computer animation and, and this idea of dreams and, and imaginations, it all makes that somewhat possible for people today. Uh, people live in uh, dream worlds these days. I mean, kids are playing video games nonstop and they're living in fantasy worlds. They're absolutely living in a fantasy world. And you know, I love video games. I, I've spent a lot of time playing them myself. And you get into it to a degree that you, you really like being there. Hey, this is better than reality. I'll just stay here all the time and until my thumbs wear out. And, uh, and it's kind of fun and all that stuff. But, um, you know, it is really an escape from the reality that we have been given by God. And when we think about this idea of reality, we think about the imaginations of man's heart we go back again to the pre-flood days and the Bible says that's what God was looking at, what we were thinking, what, we, what kind of imaginations we had, 
the intents of our heart, the, the imaginations that we had. Look at it in Genesis 6, 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And, and certainly we put that evil in front of us on a continual basis. Maybe we're not actually going out and carrying out those sins, but certainly our minds are being warped by those things. Our minds are being given over to those things. And the imaginations of our heart, that's where wickedness comes from. Jesus said, hey, the, the things that come out of your mouth, they're coming from deep down in your heart. It's not what goes in, it's what comes out. That's what defiles a man. That's what Jesus said. And it's because we allow our minds to become warped. It's because we allow just anything to come in. And, uh, you know, I, again, I didn't uh, go into the details, but what they were talking about is, is really just, hey, you know, let your mind go, you know, let your mind think of whatever. And, you know, we know that uh, demonic possession takes place when we just give ourselves over, right? I want to give myself over to whatever experience. I want to give, I want to be open-minded, right? I want to just give everything a try and, and just be open-minded to things and all that kind of stuff. Uh, where the Bible teaches us, hey, be careful. Don't be deceived. Watch out. Satan's out there. He wants to pounce on you and rip you apart. And uh, you go with that kind of idea of, hey, I'm just going to be open to everything. I just want to try stuff. I want to be open. Oh, here, let, let me listen to this weird uh, ideology for a little while. Oh, let me practice that and see if it works for me in my heart. I remember um, right after high school, I was working over here in a, a sheet metal ma manufacturing plant, and I got laid off in 1986, and uh, it was a big depression, or not a depre depression, but a uh, recession of the economy, and they were laying off a lot of people. Anyway, I lost my job. And the only job I could find was selling magazines door to door. And, uh, and so here I start out on this little journey. The guy told me, yeah, you pack enough clothes for two weeks. And he made it sound like I was going to come back in two weeks. But he said, pack enough clothes for two weeks, is what he said. And so off I go. Four months later, I'm out in San Francisco, California, selling magazines door to door. And I can't get out of it because it's like a, a cult almost. And it was, a, it was the craziest thing. I had to run away from the whole thing. But anyway, as I'm selling <laughs> magazines door to door, doing this, this guy, I go into this guy's house out in California, of course, and, uh, you know, he, I think he bought a magazine, and he said, hey, how you doing in your sales, you know? And I said, oh, I'm doing all right. And here I am, like 18 years old, dumb as a box of rocks. I don't know what's going on. I got this stupid job that I hate, you know? I'm just trying to figure the life out. And, and, uh, and this guy says, yeah, I'm a salesman too. He says, you know what works for me a lot? Let me, let me, let me tell you this. And, and so he says, um, he, he shows me this piece of paper. And he says, if you just kind of uh, memorize this and say this phrase over and over and over again, it'll really give you a positive energy and help you to sell magazines better than what you're doing right now. And I was like, what is it? <laughs> what language is that? <laughs> and it was this like new age chant. You know, hoy, 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 hoy. You know, it didn't make any sense. I didn't know what he was saying, but here, you just say this over and over and over again. And it was like, om, you know, meditate on your belly button. It was that kind of stuff, you know. But it was this whole phrase that you were supposed to repeat over and over and over again. Oh, okay, I'll try it. And I did. I'm stupid enough. Okay, whatever works. And you know, that's the kind of mentality that people get into when their thoughts are not guided by the Word of God. When they're not grounded in the truth of God, you'll try just about anything to make life work, won't you? Including some pretty far out uh, satanic ideas that can completely destroy your life and take over your mind and your soul. And uh, you know, after a little while, I just kind of threw it away. It wasn't helping me sell magazines, so I, I threw that <laughs> thing in the trash. But later on, you know, when I started walking with the Lord, I heard that and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's a new age weird. I mean, it was, uh, I, I think it was Buddhism or something. I mean, it was, it was some really crazy thing. But anyway, um, the thoughts and the intents of man's heart, only on evil continually. Why? Because we're not grounded in God's word. We're not 
washing our minds and our thoughts with God's word. We're not subjecting ourselves to God. We're subjecting ourselves to that world out there. And that world has a, a ruler that is Satan himself. And he'd like nothing better than to destroy you and your family and this society at the same time. And he's doing a pretty good job of it, I would say. And so the last part of this deals with, okay, if we're going to go down that path, what does God have to say about that? If you're going to say, I don't want to glorify God. I'm not going to be thankful to him. I don't want to have my mind set on him. I don't want to think about his word. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Okay, what does God say? Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature more rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so you see there uh, this idea of God giving them up. God giving people over to the lust of their flesh, giving them over to what they really want and, and the desires of their heart. But it ends up destroying them. It ends up destroying them. And you see that as, as you go on there. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, vile passions. And again, if you look at the society that we're living in right now, uh, it's headed in that direction on full blast, right? There are no restraints. You can't say it's wrong. You can't say anything against it. If you do, you'll be completely ostracized by the society and maybe even penalized. And we see how that's going, don't we? I mean, we see what happens now when you stand up against the, the, the authorities who have this woke left-wing agenda. Uh, you might spend some time in jail for it. You might lose your job, for sure. Uh, people might come to your house and protest you with the, the news cameras on there, making you feel you know, pretty threatened. You might uh, do some jail time for it. They might trump up some charges against you. You never know what's going to happen in the society that we're living in. I, I'm, just, uh, I'm just amazed at some of the things that we're seeing in the last couple of years. But that is how the society is giving themselves over. They're completely in alignment, not with God's word, but with uh, the vile passions of man. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you up to that. But again, wrath will fall as a result. Now, what are some of the outworkings of that? What are some of the things that happen when, when man wants vile passion and goes after those things rather than going after God and God says, okay, I'm going to give you up to that. Even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now that's old King James language. And it's very puritanized. You know, it's not coming right out and saying what it means, right? But you don't have to have a college degree to understand what's being said there, right? It's pretty clear that these vile passions drove women to women against the natural use uh, of a man. And also men left the natural use of women and burned in their lust towards other men. And it's very clear what's going on here. But the Bible says it's shameful. It's an amazing thing that, uh, you know, so many churches have accepted this uh, this whole lifestyle and want to make a home for people who identify themselves as in this lifestyle. And you wonder, how in the world can you as a as a church, as a church who professes to believe in Jesus Christ, professes to believe in the Bible, professes to believe that the Bible has something to say about how we should live our lives. How in the world do you get around a passage of scripture like that? And the truth is that they just don't read it. They, they just don't read it. They dance around it. And they come right out and lie to the entire 
world and say the Bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality being wrong. They come right out and tell a bold-faced lie about the fact that the New Testament doesn't have any prohibitions against homosexuality or against, you know, A, B, and C, LGBT. <laughs> when this passage is very clear, not only about what is happening, but about why it's happening, about the fact that God gave them over to it, that it's shameful, and that there's a penalty that's going to be paid. It's very clear, isn't it? But they reject it completely. Why? Because they're suppressing the truth, desiring to live a life of immorality. And so, <clears throat> it's very clear, I think, in Scripture. Uh, ch verse 28, through the rest of the, the passage here, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. Again, that, that phrase, God gave them to it. If that's what you want, I'm going to give you over to it. But look at what he's giving them too. A debased mind to do the things which are not fitting. And you think about something being debased. You know, if you're on a firm foundation um, and, and that foundation becomes unstable for some reason. Uh, I remember working here at a manufacturing plant a couple years ago and, and I was the kind of the plant manager, facility manager and and uh, we were experiencing a lot, a lot of growth at the time. And um, my boss, the, the president of the company, he was bringing in new machines all the time. And I mean, he's bringing these massive 30 ton brakes, you know, and, and laser cutting machines and all this stuff. And it was my job to get those things on a firm foundation, bolt them to the concrete floor and ground them and all that stuff to make sure they weren't going to move and go anywhere or fall over so they could do the manufacturing that they were doing. And I mean, oh, just the, the work that had to be done just to get those monsters onto a firm foundation and the thought of what would happen if those things would fall over. I had to do these big jib cranes and stuff and, and uh, just the weight that these things were dealing with. Uh, and, and the thought of what would happen if those things fell off that foundation that I built, you know, and somebody got killed or, or hurt really badly, you know, and it was, it was very present on my mind as I was dealing with those things. But you think about a mind becoming debased, a mind that is slipped off that foundation, the bolts of the nuts have come off and the grounding wires and everything have, have malfunctioned and that thing is now off to the side and floundering and it really paints this picture you know that God wants us to be on a firm foundation God wants us to be a based mind not a debased mind a mind that is 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 securely fastened onto a firm foundation and of course that is throughout the New Testament we find this idea of hey be steadfast Paul says you know get grounded in the truth you know and uh when we give ourselves over, when we allow our minds to get this corruption, when we just sit there and take it all in, take it all in, take it all in, and don't have any kind of discernment about, no, I'm not going to watch that. Oh, stop that. You know, I'm, I'm not going there. When we just say, hey, just have an open mind. I just want to enjoy life and, and have, you know, experience all that it has to offer me and all those kind of things. Uh, God says, okay, go ahead. You'll pay a heavy price for it, though. You'll pay a heavy price, and your brain is going to fall off that foundation, and you'll fall for everything from that point. If you have nothing to base your truth on, you'll believe anything. And uh, unfortunately, we see that happening to a lot of people in the world today. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, Sexual immorality, and again, this is that point where it's not just about sexual immorality. It's not just about LGBTQ. It's about our wicked heart desiring what we want instead of what God wants for us. Our will instead of God's will. Our purposes instead of God's purposes. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, 
full of envy, <clears throat> murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people fall into that category, Christians especially. Maybe I don't go out and do that stuff, but I certainly don't holler and scream about it too much when I'm watching it or when I'm being entertained by it or, you know, when it uh, suits me. You know, it's okay. You know, I'm not the one doing it. I'm just enjoying it, you know, that kind of stuff. The, the uh, spectators who are not actually going out and doing it, but they're getting a great deal of thrill out of watching other people do it perhaps, or at least supporting what's being done. And, and of course, again, these incredible words that are being used here. This is what happens to the unbased heart, un, uh, debased heart. When your mind is not set on that firm foundation of God's word and uh, our mind is not being led by the Holy Spirit and being washed by the water of the word, we become debased. We become uh, sexually immoral and all those things that are being discussed here. But again, God says there will be a price to pay. And, you know, there's a big difference, I think, between saying, you know, I struggle with these things. All these things or some of these things, one or two of these things, that's something I struggle with. It's something I haven't quite mastered and, and I hate that about myself and I, I ask God to forgive me and you know every time it happens to me I repent of those things and, and I wish I could just overcome that struggle in my flesh. There's a big difference between that and somebody who says, I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care what God says. I'm going for it. I'm giving myself over to that completely and I don't care what the consequences are. And that's where God's wrath is going to fall on that person, that person who suppresses that truth so that many others are deceived as a result. And so I'm going to wrap that up here uh, as far as my portion of it. And then uh, we'll, we'll turn off the Facebook and we'll just have a, a bit of a discussion here at the end. But uh, let me go ahead and, and just pray and then we'll do that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to, again, fellowship with one another and fellowship with you. We thank you for the opportunity to be washed by your word and to be uh, firmly secured back onto that foundation if we've slipped a little bit. And Father, we desire to stay on that firm foundation that you've given us and, uh, and to build on that foundation with not wood, hay, and stubble, but, Father, with gold and silver and precious jewels and gems that will withstand the test of time and withstand the fires of eternity. And we praise you for these things, Lord. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.